Good afternoon, colleagues. The uh, first out of, of business this afternoon is portfolio questions. On this occasion, it is education and skills. As ever, anybody uh, wishing to ask a supplementary should press the request to speak buttons during the relevant uh, questions. There is quite a bit of interest, as you might expect, so I would uh, make the usual plea for brief questions and answers to match. Question number one from Stuart McMillan has been withdrawn. So question number two, Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it considers to be the educational impact of open clan classrooms on primary school children. Cabinet Secretary. Local authorities are responsible for ensuring that the schools in their area, whatever the design, are capable of providing an appropriate environment for effective learning and teaching. Therefore, in consideration of the educational merits of open plan classrooms is a matter for local authorities. However, as part of our school building programme, we gather feedback from schools and have heard how pupils and teachers can benefit from the increased connectivity which open plan environments can offer. But it is also important to consider the impact of activities which could be seen or heard between spaces and the positive or disruptive impact they may have on others. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the Minister for that response, or the Cabinet Secretary rather. Open plan environments are perceived to benefit child social development. However, they are much noisier, and such an environment impacts adversely on learning. Studies found that children in the noisiest open plan classrooms have significantly lower speech perception ability and slow response times than those being taught in traditional classrooms. Open plan classrooms are therefore not appropriate for young or sensitive children, while for teachers it can mean raised blood pressure, increased stress levels, headaches, and fatigue. What steps are Scottish ministers and cause are taking to review the use of open plan classrooms or at least uh, improve the acoustics in classrooms to minimise noise and ensure that adequate learning can take place? Cabinet Secretary. Well, although the design and operation of school buildings um, are, of course, managed by local authorities to best suit their individual needs and circumstances, particularly of their specific pupil cohorts, as part of our school buildings programme, as I've mentioned, we do continue to receive feedback from schools um, and, importantly, uh, from those who use uh, the open plan classrooms. Our Learning Estates strategy, which was produced jointly between the Scottish Government and COSLA, does make clear that learning environments should support and facilitate excellent joined-up learning and teaching to meet the needs of all learners. And it is important to stress that these um, facilities need to work for all. The strategy also emphasises that teaching and learning environments should support the well-being of learners, meet the varying needs to support inclusion. And we will continue to have discussions, of course, uh, both with young people themselves, uh, with uh, parents and uh, teachers, as we continue uh, to ensure that our learning estate strategy moves forward. And be supplementary, Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And to follow on with what Kenneth Gibson has said, the last time we had um, an estates programme was in 2009. But the Scottish Government are, re are responsible for the Building Standards Technical Handbook published in 2020 for non domestic buildings. This calls on auditory investigations to take place from new buildings. Is the Secretary of State confident? That, is, sorry, is the Cabinet Secretary confident that these acoustic assessments are being made of buildings which are then exposing children in open classrooms to excessive noise? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I thank uh, the, the member for that uh, question. It is a very important aspect that we look into um, how we are developing our learning estates um, programme and the work that goes on uh, between COSLA and the Scottish Government as we develop the design process for that. So I would be more than happy to get back to the member specifically as we look at the learning estates programme to also look at how that works uh, with uh, the um, wider issues which he's mentioned there on building standards. So if the member will forgive me, I'll get back to him on the detail of that. Question number three, Ronan Mackay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what its position is on whether parents should have the right to appeal on school placement decisions. Cabinet Secretary. Under the Education Scotland Act 1980, decisions on school placements are the responsibility of the local authority. The views of parents should be taken into account. Parents should also be informed of the options available to them to appeal these decisions. If an agreement cannot be reached, parents and carers have the right to make a placing request to a school of their choice. If a placing request is refused, parents have a right to appeal. Rona Mackay. I thank the, Minister, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. I'm currently trying to help a constituent who's been told that her son, who's been in a mainstream primary school and has flourished, must go to an ASN school next year instead of a mainstream secondary school with his uh, friends and peer group. Can the Cabinet Secretary set out what right to appeal parents, carers and pupils have in a situation like this? Cabinet Secretary. 
School. Under the Standards in Scotland Schools etc Act, local authorities have a duty to provide education in a mainstream school unless specific exemptions apply. Authorities are supported in these decisions by our guidance on the presumption of mainstream education. I have set out the routes to appeal in my initial answer um, and I would um, urge uh, your constituent uh, to engage with the school and local authority to resolve their concerns. They may also wish to contact the Enquire Service uh, to discuss the details of their situation. Uh, but if the um, details that I gave in my original um, answer um, are perhaps not detailed enough uh, for Ms. Ms Mackay and to help her constituent, um, I would of course be um, happy to receive uh, further information um, in writing uh, to see if there is further information I can give her um, on those um, rights to appeal in this very specific circumstance that she has mentioned of the constituent's case. And supplementary, Megan Gallagher. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In 2022, there were over 350 fewer primary school teachers than in 2021, and there were fewer teachers from the teacher induction scheme teaching in their post preparation year than at any time since the scheme began. Key to restoring our world class education system is reducing class sizes. Why then is this government cutting teacher numbers at a time when school pupils have faced so much disruption over the last three years? Cabinet Secretary. Um, forgive me, I'm not seeing the relevance to the qu original question, but I'm more than happy uh, to um, answer that. Of course, uh, certainly, I would agree, Cabinet Secretary. I mean, I'll keep uh, your response brief on that basis. Certainly, uh, recruitment and um, retention is, of course, a matter uh, for local authorities um, of staff. Uh, the government, of course, has a commitment to ensure that we have 3,500 um, additional teachers by the end of this parliamentary term. And part of that process has been um, a further funding that has been baselined to local government of £145.5 million to support the teaching workforce. Thank you. Question four, Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what cross-government review it has undertaken of policies supporting children with autism, including any assessment of the links between autism and other conditions such as ADHD. Mr. Claire Hoy. In March 2021, following a review, the Scottish Government published our Learning, Intellectual Disabilities and Autism Towards Transformation Plan. The plan looks at the actions needed to shape supports, services and attitudes to ensure that the human rights of autistic people and people with learning intellectual disabilities are respected and protected. The plan includes a range of actions across the lifespan, including actions related to education, restraint and seclusion, health, post-diagnostic support, social care and employment. In September 2021, we published the National Neurodevelopmental Specification for Children and Young People, which sets out seven standards for service providers to ensure that children and young people who have neurodevelopmental profiles receive the support they need. This includes both autism and ADHD. ADHD affects 5 to 7 per cent of the population and co-occurrence across neurodevelopmental conditions is the norm. And we know from research that 50 to 70 per cent of autistic people also pre present with ADHD and 20 to 50 per cent of children with ADHD also meet the criteria for autism. Miles Briggs. Can I thank the Minister for that useful answer? One of my constituents, a mother of two boys who were diagnosed with autism by NHS Lothian um, some years back, uh, has told me about how she watched her boys struggle to function at school and in society for up to six years. My constituent took her uh, family, the boys, to a private ADHD assessment and they were both diagnosed and given the necessary support and medication which has helped to transform their lives. Can I ask the Minister, will the Scottish Government agree to to review pathways and guidance to ensure that all health boards across Scotland are taking a holistic approach to the assessment of children and that health boards will review existing cases over the last five years to offer those who have been diagnosed with autism the chance for an additional ADHD assessment. Minister. So um, I think um, we're straying into the territory uh, that is under the portfolio responsibility of my colleagues in, in health. But what I am able to see here, and I will ask the, the Minister for um, Mental Wellbeing and Social Care to respond directly to the points that you raise in terms of health board pathways. Um, but Scottish Government policies take a, a wide neurodevelopmental approach that is inclusive of people with a range of conditions, including autism, learning disabilities, ADHD and fetal alcohol syndrome. And we fund the National Autism Implementation Team as a key partner, and they support us with uh, policy development across health and social care, but also in education. I've got a couple of supplementaries. Both they and the responses will need to be brief. First, Fiona Hislop. 
it's understood that the impact of changes that occur in adolescence are more difficult for some neurodiverse young people to manage than for their neurotypical peers. Can the Minister outline what engagement it has had with neurodiverse adolescents and their parents to ensure Scottish Government policies intended to support young neurodiverse people reflects the particular difficulties associated with this transition? Minister. So, um, uh, in line with um, all development of policy in the area of uh, those with lived experience, Scottish Government will engage regularly with uh, service providers, with children and young people and their families and carers, and also with key stakeholders in the development of pathways and of service provision. And Choudhury. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Multiple constituents have approached me concerned about the way that school treat their child with autism and the impact of this had on their child's mental health. Can the Minister please outline what action the Scottish Government is taking to ensure that children with autism are offered uh, sufficient mental health support in school and are safeguard against poor practice? And as briefly as possible, Minister. So, uh, again, I think this strays into the territory of, of the, the health portfolio, but the additional support for learning review in 2020 set out a clear direction on how we continue to build on the progress and make recommend, made recommendations on how to improve the implementation of additional support for learning, which is absolutely vital for, uh, this, uh, uh, for these young people. And we published our joint action plan with COSLA and ADES in October 2020, setting out the measures that we will take to implement those recommendations. And last November, we published our second progress report and updated action plan, highlighting that 24 of the 76 recommendations were completed with the rest under so I hope that gives uh, the member some reassurance about the work that's being done in the education portfolio. But if there are other areas that he, wish to pick, he wishes to pick up that are covered by my colleagues in health, I'm more than happy to get them to write back to him. Thank you. Question number five, Murdo Fraser. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what impact its draft budget for 2023-24 will have on schools. Cabinet Secretary. We have protected councils in the most challenging budget settlement since devolution by providing over £13.2 billion through the local government settlement. This represents a real terms increase compared to 22-23 and supports the continued delivery of high quality education for our children. In addition to that, our schools funding will impact the most important areas in relation to education delivery, attainment and tackling child poverty. For example, we are investing a further £200 million for the Scottish Attainment Challenge to tackle the poverty related attainment gap. We are also providing funding to local government to significantly reduce the cost of the school day. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response? But despite the largest block grant from Westminster in the history of devolution, the Scottish Government's budget delivers real terms cuts in funding to local councils, as the Accounts Commission make very clear in their report this morning. In my own region, Perth and Kinross Council are facing a £20 million budget gap for the current year which could see teacher numbers cut, child psychology cut, primary swimming lessons scrapped, all school crossing patrollers scrapped, and breakfast clubs for underprivileged children scrapped. How can the Cabinet Secretary possibly defend a budget settlement that is leading an SNP-run council to take decisions like this? Cabinet Se Cabinet Secretary. Of course, the Council uh, budgets are not set yet, and there are a variety and a uh, range um, of um, suggestions that may come forward for officials, and it is for councillors uh, to take decisions um, at, in due course. But the numbers I spoke about in my original answer um, are indeed correct. Uh, when we compare, as we do in every budget year, the proposed budget to the allocations approved by Parliament in previous year, this shows the best like for the comparison of available funding at this stage in the budget cycle. And I would quite frankly say to Murdo Fraser um, um, on this and in all aspects to do with the budget, and he hears this every year, when he wishes to see more funding being spent, whether it's in local government or directly in the education budget, he will have to ensure that they say where that money will be coming from elsewhere in the Scottish Government budget, because the government will be fully allocated. So if he wishes to see changes, presiding officer, rather than continue to talk through my answer, he may start actually writing down fully costed allocations and propose them to the Deputy First Minister. There are a number of supplementaries here and on subsequent questions. It would be helpful if members could limit themselves to asking the questions and then listening to the responses. Brief supplementary from Natalie Dawn first. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her previous assessment. Schools are only one part of the multifaceted infrastructure of Scotland's education system. 
Further to her original response, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how the 23-24 budget will protect and enhance our whole education system from early years through to lifelong learning? Briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. So through the budget, I'm continuing to invest in changing the lives of children and young people and learners across all ages. So, for example, we have the £1 billion of funding each year, continuing to deliver 1140 hours of high quality early learning and childcare. We have agreed £50 million should be allocated to the whole family wellbeing, include, including preventative holistic family support. And we are, of course, investing £38 million for activities to keep the promise to our care experienced children. These are but some of the examples I could give on how we are improving the circumstances from early years to lifelong learning. And briefly, Michael Mara. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the budget that we have in front of us has been warned by uh, COSLA that there will be significant reductions in teacher numbers across the country. The Cabinet Secretary is committed to 3,500 more teachers, despite the fact that 100 were cut in the last year. How many more of those teachers will be delivered this year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, of course, um, in the current financial year, the Scottish Government provided £145.5 uh, million pounds, uh, baselined into local government to ensure um, that um, they could, councils could uh, make changes from temporary to permanent contracts. I am exceptionally uh, disappointed to see that, despite that funding, what we saw was a reduction in teacher uh, numbers. So I will continue to have discussions um, with COSLA um, on this area, but I would repeat um, um, very briefly, presiding officer, the same point that I made to Mr Fraser of uh, Mr Mara would like to see changes made and additional funding going in uh, to this or for other areas, then he can of course suggest where that money should come from. Question number six, Daniel Johnson. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to ensure that schools are inspected regularly. Cabinet Secretary. Each year, HM Chief Inspector of Education dis determines the scale and priorities of the inspection programme in agreement with the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Skills. Prior to the pandemic, Education Scotland strengthened its scrutiny function and committed to carrying out 250 school inspections each year. This academic year, Education Scotland will meet this commitment. In an estimated 500 school inspections would have been carried out had it not been for the disruption caused by COVID. As set out in the programme for government and education reform, Bill will be introduced to establish an independent inspectorate. A high-level operating model for that new independent inspectorate is being developed and will be shared with stakeholders and users early this year. And that will set out how the inspectorate will operate effectively to provide the independent assurance of quality that our education system needs. Daniel John. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but the reality is those steps have been inadequate because uh, an FOI uh, response published in September showed that 1,118 state primary and secondary schools in Scotland hadn't been inspected in a decade. And indeed, in my local area, the picture is even worse. There are 10 schools that haven't been inspected in the last 10 years and four schools which haven't been inspected in more than 10 years. Indeed, the, the longest uh, uh, situation being 2006. There are three schools which will not have been inspected in the entirety of the lifespan of Education Scotland. So as we look to its successor organisation, can we at least guarantee to parents and pupils that their schools will be inspected at least once in the time that they attend? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I laid out in my original um, answer, uh, Presiding Officer, obviously uh, the impact uh, that COVID um, has had on the school inspection to be carried out. Uh, but as a, a point uh, to uh, reassure, I hope, uh, Dan John Johnson, I would point out, of course, that inspections aren't the only method of scrutiny. Schools and local authorities also have responsibility for evaluating performance. And indeed, in Scotland, the provision of education, with it being with local authorities, they have a duty to provide adequate and efficient school education. Education. So under the Standards and Schools Act, the local authority is responsible for improving the quality of education of schools it manages with a view to ageing standards. So yes, school inspections is exceptionally important. That's exactly why we have the high level target operating model that's being developed. And I would welcome any contributions uh, that Daniel Johnson has to that when we publish that. Uh, but it is not the only way that the government, its agencies or local authorities can ensure continuous improvement within schools. And brief supplementary Stephen Kerr. That was just more complacency from the Cabinet Secretary. The, the reality is 1,118 schools, more, nearly 50% of Scotland's schools have not been inspected for 10 years. Are you not embarrassed, Cabinet Secretary? One thing, tell us one thing that you're going to do now in order to rectify this situation. Through the Chair, Mr Kerr, Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, as I have uh, stated in my original um, answer to Daniel Johnson, there was, of course, um, an impact that we have seen on COVID of 500 school inspections that we would have expected to see happen that did not happen. And pre-COVID, Education Scotland had taken a, a great deal of work to ensure it strengthened its scrutiny functions, to ensure that it was carrying out more school inspections each year than it had done in frequent years before that. But it is very important that we take very seriously the role of school inspections. That is exactly why we have a reform process that is leading to an independent expectorate. And I would welcome the constructive um, views of Mr Kerr and others about how we can ensure that that independent inspectorate is as effective and efficient as it can be. Question number seven, Graeme Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government whether, whether it will provide an update on its progress in closing the attainment gap. Cabinet Secretary. In December, we published the latest achievement of Curriculum for Excellence Level Statistics, the 2023 National Improvement Framework and Plan, and the stretch aims each local authority has put in place for closing the attainment gap. Together, these set out the latest evidence for progress and our plans shared with local government for substantially eliminating the poverty-related attainment gap by 2026. There are promising signs that the attainment gap is once again beginning to narrow. However, there is more to do, and that is why we will invest a further £200 million next year in the Scottish Attainment Challenge, part of our £1 billion commitment this parliamentary term. Graham Simpson. Thank you. In fact, there has been no progress uh, in the last five years. No. Now, in the aftermath of the Scottish Budget, Jim Thewlis, General Secretary of School Leaders Scotland, said that education cuts will see class sizes increased and subjects removed. So how does cutting subjects and increasing class sizes help to eliminate or substantially eliminate, which is the government's phrase, the attainment gap by 2026? Well, for the sake of brevity, presiding officer, I will point to my um, previous answers that I gave to Murdo Fraser about the um, importance um, of uh, the, if uh, the member would actually uh, allow me to answer the question. That's exactly what I'll do. Uh, the issue uh, around budgets has been discussed with Murdo Fraser um, and uh, with others, and it is important that we look at the investment that's going in, not just within education, but also within local government. And uh, we are taking steps to ensure we are continuing to invest in our children and young people. But I think it is gravely unfair um, for the member to suggest that there has been no improvement. So, for example, um, again, for, for the sake of speed, I will give but one example that the gap between the proportion of primary pupils from the most and least deprived areas who achieved their expected level in literacy narrowed from um, the previous year. And that is very important. We have similarly saw that um, in numeracy as well. And for both literacy and numeracy, these figures represent the largest single narrowing of the gap since data collection began in 2016-17. So, of course, as with other educational um, areas um, across the UK and further afield, there has been an impact of COVID, and it would be wrong uh, to suggest that that is not the case. But what we are seeing within the ASO statistics um, is an improving picture, and I would have thought that is something that the member would welcome. Uh, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That, that, in fairness, was not a brief response. It's meant I'm not able to take supplementaries from either of the members that were looking to get in on this question. We need to now move on to question number eight from James Dornan, who joins us uh, remotely. To ask the Scottish Government what its priorities for education will be in 2023. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, tackling the poverty-related attainment gap remains the priority for the Scottish Government and it is at the heart of our ambitious reform programme, which aims to provide learners with the best opportunities to succeed. The priorities for Scottish education are set out in the 2023 National Improvement Framework, which was published in December 2022. They place the human rights and needs of every child and young person at the centre of education, alongside improving children and young people's health and wellbeing, closing the attainment gap, improving attainment and skills, and sustained positive school leaver destinations for all our young people. James Dorn. Thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and welcome that tackling attainment remains a key priority for the Scottish Government. I also welcome the news that Professor John McKendrick has been appointed as a new Commissioner for Fair Access to Higher Education in Scotland. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how this appointment will help drive forward progress to further close the poverty-related attainment gap? As briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, I'm also delighted uh, to uh, welcome the appointment um, of Professor John McKendrick. He brings to a role um, great experience um, to and I look forward uh, to working with him alongside uh, my colleague Mr Hepburn. Uh, that's of course a very important role as we continue uh, to see further success within the Scottish Government's ambitions on widening access. A brief supplementary first from Sue Webber. Thank you, uh, President Officer. Teachers are on strike, Cabinet Secretary, the first strike for 40 years. We have heard from countless teachers and the unions who say they feel ignored by the government, that they are not fully engaged in the negotiations. We also know violence in the classroom is up with over 20,000 instances of violence against teachers and school staff in the last academic year, ignored by the government Briefly. and unsafe in the classroom. Does the Minister accept that ending teacher strikes and making teachers safe in the classrooms must be a priority for Cabinet education? Secretary. Well, it is an indeed a uh, priority, and that's why there are further constructive talks happening today. And brief supplementary, Beatrice Wisher. In terms of priorities for education, the Scottish Government made a commitment to replace Erasmus and to create a Scottish Education Exchange Programme. And although it has been repeatedly asked for in this chamber by colleagues, the date is still elusive. Wales made this happen, so what discussions has the Scottish Government had with Welsh counterparts on this, and will the Minister commit to a timetable so that students know when they will be able to benefit from a learning exchange? As briefly as possible, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, this was, uh, of course, a, a Government uh, commitment that we hold um, very uh, dear to, and it is something that we are progressing our work on um, and will deliver within this parliamentary term. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes portfolio questions. There will be a brief, brief pause uh, before we move to the next item of business. Point of order, Mr Kerr. On a point of order, um, you, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, tried to fit in as many supplementary questions as possible, but in your remarks you said it was largely became impossible because of the length of the ministerial answers. And this is not unique to this session of topical questions, but can... But, But can I ask your guidance on what is being done in order to encourage ministers, including the First Minister, by the way, to shorten the answers they give to the questions, which are becoming more concise? I thank Mr Kerr for his point. I would say, as a former business manager, he would be well aware of the ongoing discussions that have been with business managers from all parties about the length both of the answers but also of the questions. I think in portfolio questions we have seen evidence of both not being brief, and that is something I would impress upon all members in order to provide opportunities for as many questions as possible and all parties suffer as a result, that the questions and the answers need to be as brief as possible. But I think attributing blame in one direction in this instance, Mr Kerr, is unfair and uh, inaccurate. We now move on to the next item of business.